Hi, welcome to the lecture on environmental adaptation for animals. Now we will continue on this freeze avoiding, and now we will consider on the antifreeze proteins, because we have discussed on these uh, sugar and its metabolites, like these polluols, but they can be toxic, especially if you have 300 millimole per liter glucose in your circulation. That's lethal. But also it's energy demanding because you need so huge amount of sugar in the, just to prevent the ice formation. And also it's quite ineffective. So you can only tolerate mild cold temperatures or freezing temperatures. But if it's colder or if it's long lasting, you can't tolerate it. And you get, get much better protection by having a protein that is preventing the ice crystallization. So it's interacting with the water molecules that are forming ice and preventing that, okay, if there is some ice, uh, microscopic ice, it will bind, it, it will be binded in these proteins and that's why the ice is not growing. And with this mechanism, you can either either <sighs> hi welcome to the lecture on animal adaptation of animals uh, we will now continue on the i uh... hi welcome to this lecture on animal adaptation of animals we will now continue on the freeze avoiding mechanisms and now concentrate on the anti-freezing proteins because so far we have discussed that okay, you can either use glucose or its metabolites on, on in the in your in in the body fluids to prevent the freezing. But these metabolites and the sugar can be toxic, especially if you have 300 millimole per liter of glucose in the in in the circulation. That's lethal, and it's also you need a lot of energy because now you need a lot of sugar in, in the circulation itself. And also, the good point is that you, you will lower the freezing point, the supercooling point, but the problem is that, okay, it, you can only tolerate quite l l high temperatures and short-lasting chilies. So that's why it's, it's, uh, it's not tolerate, you're not tolerating well for example, uh, cold weather in Finland. And you can get much better protection by using proteins that are preventing the ice crystallization. And the, uh, how they do it, they are interacting with water molecules that are forming the ice. And then there can be microscopic ice crystals that are touched by these proteins, and then these ice crystals cannot grow anymore. So that's why they stabilize the supercooling water. And with this mechanism, you can tolerate long time cold temperatures. So you can get much better protection. And originally they were found in Antarctic fish because it's living throughout the year below zero. And that's why we have discussed during this course already on these antifreezing proteins. But it's also characterized in insects and spiders and plants and fungi and bacteria. So it's in all kinds of animals, except diptera. So the flies are not using these proteins, although the flies are very common in Arctic areas. So if you have a protein that is not common in all animals on the world, but animals that are tolerating cold in quite cold environments, like insects and a fish, it must be that, okay, it's been developed several times during the evolution. And these are quite heavily studied because it's so fuzzy protein. In arthropods, it's been sequenced in di several different uh, organisms and found 
uh, on, on, on several others, and typically they are not very close to each other in, in the sequence, but they all have similar uh, repeats. And that's why they all, that we think that, okay, they all look like these kind of strings. And so there's a flat, a sur a flat surface that is involving on the uh, eyes adsp uh, adsorption. So they are, you have a string with very uh, repeating uh, elements or, or, or residues, and then they are all binding water molecules or ice crystals. And they have a lot of different kinds of these. So mealworm has over 30 genes that are coding these anti-freezing proteins. And if you are checking that, okay, what is the structure of them? There can be some that are found in the mid-gut, and they are most of them are quite close to each other, then the one is, is a little bit far. But then we have other that are in the epithelia of the mid-cut. Then we have some that are in the hemolymph. And all these are in the fat body. So there is a in different parts of the animal you can find different kind of antifreezing proteins and that makes it confusing that okay they must have some kind of differences because of they have different kind of sequences and that's why they have different kind of properties on this uh, ice formation etc but also in vertebrates over here is winter flutter it has type 1 and it lives in the North America. Then we have a Sculporn Scofield. It has two different kind of antifreezing proteins. And again on the North Atl Atlantic. Then we have Atlantic herring. It has type 2 antifreezing protein. Then we have rainbow smelt having high glycerol. Then we have sea raven. They have ocean pot. We have eel pot. Now we have they have type three, even so there are three different or four different types. Then we have these Antarctic toothfish that are having actually uh, glucoproteins, and we have Arctic cod. And you can see that okay in the fish species we have four different antifreezing proteins, and then we have these antifreezing glucoproteins, and some are living around the Antarctica and some are living near the Arctic Sea. And the, all these proteins look completely different. And you can see that, okay, there is no similarities. So some are just like the strings in, in the invertebrates. Some are looking completely different. They can't be from the same source. And they've been developing by, from other proteins with gene duplication. Well, on the type 1, we don't know from which, what kind of proteins it's been developed. But on the type 2, it's quite near lectins that are binding sugars and working in the cell adhesion, so binding cells to each other. Then we have type 3, that is a member of these soft proteins that are sialic acid synthases, and they are glycoproteins. So they are affecting, uh, doing something else normally, but now they are used for antifreezing. Then we have these anti, uh, anti, uh, antifreezing proteins four that are uh, apolipoproteins that are on usually on the coenzymes so or lipid transporter. So we have used transporters, and now after gene uh, duplication, you have now two copies of the gene, and now you can modify one to produce some uh, antifreezing protein. And then what they are doing are oh, they are ca causing these thermal hysteresis. So they are lowering the 
freezing point of the body fluids. And as you can see that there is no direct uh, link on the phylo phylogenic tree that okay those could uh, that are close to each other they would use the same kind of uh, same kind of antifreezing proteins. So they are unhomologous and they are not determinated on the phylogenic. And even the antifreezing glycoproteins are quite interesting. That okay, they are, you need only three amino acids and then a, a sugar. And they are quite similar in Antarctic and Arctic uh, animals, but they have different intron extron structure in this code, uh, signal segments and the codon for AAT repeat. So that's why it's not from the same source. And because one animal is also on the Arctic area and another one is on Antarctic. And when they were having a common ancestor, we didn't have the uh, so-called temperatures in, in those polar areas. So it, it's, it's been developed several times during the evolution, and that's why it's called convergent evolution. And these are also regulated. Like Ose and Pout, when they are living in North, they have 10 times more antifreezing proteins. So it can be, it's, it's always seasonally controlled, but the trigger is different in different species. So it can be initiated before the winter, and but it also can be initiated as the response of freezing conditions. And in some animals, like this ocean pole, it has all throughout the year some antifreezing protein, but it increased ten times more when the, it's it's in in colder environments. And for example, in this finder folder, this is how it works. When it's cold time, it will upregulate it very drastically. So it's I increase the concentration of this protein from November all the way till May, and it will be very high, even 10 milligram per milliliter, and it's quite ineffective actually. It will reduce the freezing point perhaps one degrees of Celsius, but it's enough because it's the icy water is not minus 10 degrees of Celsius anyway. It's a few degrees below zero. And how it can be modulated or, or controlled in physiological way. So first of all, in the summertime and one winter time, you have different kind of photoperiod. And that will affect on the central nervous system and affect on the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus is regulating the pituitary gland that is releasing growth hormone. And in presence of growth hormone, it will bind on the growth hormone receptor that will affect on the antifreezing protein G and limit the transcription. So there is no mRNA, so meaning that okay, there is no growth hormone. Then in the winter time, that when there is a short daylight that affects that okay, now there is no growth hormone. So the growth hormone receptor is not occupied and that's not limiting the antifreezing protein. So there is a messenger RNA from this antifreezing protein G. So the transcription is working, but if the temperature is high, the messenger RNA is decreted. So it's not producing any proteins, but if it's low temperature, there will be protein formation and first on, on this kind of pre-pro hormone uh, uh, or protein that is cut to pro uh, protein and released to form the major antifreezing protein in the blood. So there are practically all the physiological responses related on the hormones and, and photoperiod and, and central neural system that is affecting on these uh, uh, 
synthases and synthases of, of, of these antifreezing proteins. Quite confusing. Thank you.